Good afternoon. It is my honor to be serving as chairman of your International Tennis Hall of Fame and Museum. It's also my pleasure to welcome you to the 2012 induction ceremonies here in absolutely beautiful Newport, Rhode Island. This weekend, we honor the incredible achievements of our 2012 induction class. In 1881, this Newport casino hosted the first United States National Tennis Championships, now known as the U.S. Open. In 1954, through the hard work of Candy and Jimmy Van Allen, the USTA sanctioned this beautiful facility as the National Lawn Tennis Hall of Fame. Starting in 1975, individuals from the worldwide tennis community became eligible for induction into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Today, we will honor several, of the, several with the very highest honor in the game of tennis. These very special players and contributors exemplify the greatest traditions of our sport. Perseverance, integrity, passion, athleticism, and sportsmanship. Their accomplishments both on and off the courts are the very reason why we are here to pay tribute to them with this highest honor and most prestigious award in the game. Very shortly, these we honor today will be Hall of Famers a title only bestowed on the very few and the very best. There are some very special guests here on the Bill Talbert Senate Court who have come to help us salute our 2012 induction class and to revisit the one and only International Tennis Hall of Fame. First, I'd like our official party seated directly behind me to be recognized. We're very happy to have a number of distinguished Hall of Famers with us today. Elected in 1966, a great, excuse me, elected in 1996, a great champion who won the very first tournament ever on the WTA circuit. Please welcome Ms. Rosie Casals. <laughs> Considered one of the greatest doubles players of all times, she won an impressive 14 Grand Slam titles. Class of 2010, Gigi Fernandez. From the class of 2011, the very first employee of the Women's Tennis Association, please welcome Ms. Peachy Kelmeyer. <laughs> because of this Hall of Famer and another one we honor today, there is a game called wheelchair tennis. It flourishes and the sport is doing terrific. Inducted in 2010, please welcome Mr. Brad Parks. One of the greatest tennis organizers from the great city of St. Louis, please recognize Mr. Earl Butch Buckholz. <laughs> Vice Chairman of the International Tennis Hall of Fame and 2009 Hall of Famer, the one and only Donald Dell. Great champion of all the slams from Australia via Texas, please welcome 2010 inductee, Owen Davidson. From the class of 1971, who honors us by coming back to the Hall of Fame very frequently, a great champion, please welcome Mr. Vic Satius. Inducted in 2009, a 10 Grand Slam champion. You'll hear from her shortly, but please recognize and, and congratulate Ms. Monica Sellis. <laughs> Succeeding our president, Tony Trabert, it's my honor to, to uh, introduce to you uh, the president of the International Tennis Hall of Fame and 1987 Hall of Famer, Mr. Stan Smith. To my left are a group of individuals who are the leadership of the International Tennis Hall of Fame and Museum as it has grown into the marvelous institution it is today. Their dedication to the preservation and history of the sport of tennis, both past and present, is unparalleled. The Hall of Fame has grown and flourished through the years because of their commitment and guidance. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our Chief Executive Officer Mark Stenning and the Executive Committee and Board of Directors of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Please stand.
I would also like to recognize the families and special friends of today's inductees. They've seen our inductees at their greatest, and maybe they're not so great, and they've supported and encouraged their tennis dreams and celebrated their accom accomplishments. I would, also, I would also like to ask the families and special friends of our inductees seated across from me and to my right to please stand and be recognized so we can thank you. Before we begin our formal induction ceremony, I'd like to salute and remember a few individuals whose support and friendship meant so much to all of us involved with the Tennis Hall of Fame. I'd first like to remember a treasured board and active museum committee member who passed away this year, Marilyn Furberger. We also remember the great, honorable Judge Robert J. Kelleher, who was inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame in 2000. And finally, a broadcaster of this event and tournament for over 32 years, a man whose presence was always felt both on and off the court. He was the voice of our tennis tournament and our induction ceremonies. The gentleman's, na the gentleman's name is Barry McKay. In honor of his 32 years of dedicated service, we placed a chair where he sat up there in the production booth in memoriam to his legacy and his spirit. For over 50 years, the International Tennis Hall of Fame has worked hard to preserve and to promote the history of this great sport and continues to honor the legacies of individuals who embody its traditions. Today, we will begin by honoring two members of our 2012 class, Randy Snow and Jennifer Capriotti. We are very fortunate to have with us Officer Jim Jimmy Winters of the Newport Police Department, who will be singing the national anthem of the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Please be seated. Now gives me great pleasure to pay tribute to our first 2012 inductee. He was a pioneer, a promoter, talented player, and one of the greatest wheelchair athletes ever, Thomas Randy Snow. We are very pleased to have with us today Randy's father, Thomas Snow. He will accept this honor in his son's memory. To introduce Tom today, please welcome Randy's very close friend, Dr. Ballard more. Good afternoon. In 1975, at the age of 16, Randy Snow was working on a farm in Texas when a 1,000-pound bale of hay fell on his lower back. It paralyzed him immediately. Randy was a ranking junior player at the time, and he felt that he would never play tennis again. After several years of surgeries, hardship, 
adjustments mentally and physically. In 1980, he went to the wheelchair tennis games in Champaign, Illinois. Brad Parks was there showing the new sport that he had invented, wheelchair tennis. He asked Randy, hit a few serves. Randy hit three or four serves, acing all the opponents on the other side. Brad said, you've got to play this game. We have the first national tournament in Orange County in California in October. Please come. Randy really got into it at that time. He had already played some wheelchair basketball and had some mobility skills. He trained very hard, went to that tournament, finishing in the finals. During the next decade, Randy Snow won the US Open National Wheelchair Singles Championships 10 times and won the national doubles six times. In 1991, Randy was named by the ITF as the number one wheelchair tennis player in the world. In 1992, at Barcelona in the Paralympic Games, he won gold in singles and doubles. In 2004, Randy was inducted into the Olympic Hall of Fame, the only wheelchair athlete ever to be so honored. Randy credited the love and support of his large family who are here today. <laughs> Sorry. In addition to being a great tennis player, Randy also became a tremendous teacher of the game. Through his love of people, he gave thousands the opportunity to learn and play the great game of tennis. If you have the opportunity to ever go to Wimbledon, coming out of the locker rooms, there's a sign written by the great poet and writer from England, Rudyard Kipling. It says, treat both triumph and disaster as imposters, either one. Randy took it one step further. On his terrible day, when his back was broken, that was his greatest disaster. But he took it further and became the greatest wheelchair tennis player in the world. <laughs> If Randy were here today, he would tell you that life provides you with opportunities and disappointments. There will be wins, losses, successes, failures. One thing is certain, life will go on. Make the decision to go further. One of the greatest things in my life is my association with Randy Snow as his friend and coach, and it's my tremendous honor today for me to present at this time Randy's father, Tom Snow, to accept Randy's induction into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Thank you, Bell, or Dr. Moore, as he's officially known. It would be the gro grossest understatement that I've ever made in my life if I were to say what a pleasure, honor, tribute, and humbling experience it is to be here today and to represent Randy Snow and his family in this ceremony. The only thing that could make this ceremony any more exciting or any more eventful would be if Randy were here to make these comments himself. 
Well, it's well recognized that Randy, uh, his pioneering spirit, his laser focus, helped change the game of wheelchair tennis all over the world. But Randy was, his modest manner would prevent him from standing or sitting here and telling you of all his accomplishments. So I'm not going to do that again today. It's well documented. I'm going to mention a few catalysts hurriedly that were the highlights or the events that we feel were the catalyst for Randy's success. First, Randy would obviously mention the name of Brad Parks who was inducted into this Hall of Fame in 2010. Brad, Brad, Brad provided the leadership and the spark that launched the sport of, of wheelchair tennis. And without his vision and persistence, Randy would not have been able to accomplish what he did. Uh, it's all due to the what Brad already had in place when Randy became part of the wheelchair tennis. When I was young, I had a he hero by the name of Lou Gehrig. Most of you don't know Lou Gehrig, but when I was young, he was my hero. Randy's hero was Brad Parks. Some of you will re recall the fierce and friendly rivalry that Brad um, and Randy had when they were competitive um, athletes. Um, those matches, if you recall, uh, were so outstanding that they resulted in uh, helping the, the opportunity to be here today. Um, thank, thank you, Brad. Secondly, in Randy's uh, wheelchair career, he had the very good fortune to meet the man that was just up here previously. He's known as the man of theory. When Dr. Moore met Randy, Dr. Moore was contemplating retiring, but he and Randy got together and started talking about wheelchair tennis. Uh, I'm sure Randy begged him to not retire. They got together and they formed a very, very powerful partnership. His efforts um, were invaluable in, in Randy's uh, career. They published books, they had con conducted clinics, and camps, and uh, we owe you, Val, everything. Uh, next, um, I'd mention, uh, if you read uh, Randy's book, Pushing Forward, he mentions in there a lady by the name of Marilyn Hamilton. Marilyn had, had a serious accident where a hang glider crashed, and uh, later on, she was trying to decide what she could do for wheelchair athletes, and she couldn't understand why the aluminum and, and hang gliders couldn't be made into athletic wheelchairs. Randy met her, and the, the rest is history. She already had a company named Quickie Designs. They got together, and through her technology skills and Randy's athletic skills, they partnershiped, and so that today, all of the wheelchair athletes now have what is known as a quickie wheelchair that started with Maryland. Uh, so I can't give enough credit for Maryland. She's right there with Val and, and Brad Parks and Randy's success. Then we get down to friends, friends and family. A lot of the family people are here today. There's, I think, some eight of us all here together. He has a large, large family. It's blended, extended, and every kind of mix-up that you can make. But uh, they're all here today in spirit, uh, and they'll be following what we do here today very closely. As friends, as far friends, if there was ever a, a Pied Piper, it was Randy Snow. Randy Snow could meet people, and, and they, whether it was a U.S. president, or someone wanting him to be the godparent of their children, or children at clinics, they all migrated to Randy, I say like bees to honey. He had this personality that uh, he obviously got from his mother. He certainly didn't get it from me. Uh, and I've got to recognize her, or Randy will be quite upset with me, that there's one person in this crowd today or watching on television that we should recognize as being the person that was the bedrock of Randy's career, his personal life, which ran from the heights to unfathomable depths. 
and that's his mother who's sitting over here at the end of this row right here. Randy had so many friends that uh, it would be, we'd be here till six o'clock tonight if, if I started trying to name them, so I'm not gonna name any of them. They all know who they are, we know who they are, and, and I hope that they're able to see this and hear me, to me for me to express to them all of the appreciation that Randy has and the family has for their support. Finally, we get down to the organizations. Without, without, without these organizations, Randy would not have been able to receive this award or participate in any of the clinics or anything else that he accomplished. And they're all familiar names, but I've got to mention them. I'm not going to get into the people in those, in those organizations because there's too many of them and they've been so helpful that it'd be impossible to even try to name all their names. But. I would like to mention the United States Tennis Association, the United States Professional Tennis Association, the International Wheelchair Federation, the International Paralympic Committee, and several others that I'm sure I'm going to miss. And of course, there's the granddaddy of them all, the International Tennis Federation. When Randy was in El Salvador teaching at a children's clinic, and he had his um, heart attack and died. He was at a children's tennis camp that was being sponsored in part by the International Federation, Tennis Federation. And our dealings with them since, since Randy's passing are, are unbelievable and there's no way that we can possibly show all of our gratitude and appreciation for all that they've done on behalf of Randy. And by doing that, they've, they've also I've uh, shown their support for wheelchair tennis and they've embraced wheelchair tennis and so that now then we're slowly getting to the point to where we people are beginning to realize that physically impaired athletes are really no different from able-bodied athletes. They have that one, one problem, but that's the only difference and they deserve the recognition and support that everyone's getting and that we're just about to that part through efforts of these organizations that I just named. In, in closing, in Randy's book, Pushing Forward, he quotes a fellow by the name of Dr. Bryce Young of uh, the Vandermeer Tennis Academy. And in that, he said there are three stages of an athlete's career. First stage is he creates his image uh, through his benefit of his body, his talents, his self-determination, second stage, he goes out and he achieves uh, awards, honors through his athletic success. And the third stage is he becomes a statesman, showing compassion for his fellow man and people that have the same aspirations that Randy had. Uh, I'm not gonna mention Randy's quote, but I, I would submit that there's one more stage that we're here because Randy's not here, and I'd like to add the word legacy to that. After statesmanship, we need to consider legacy. And we, through the new Randy's, Randy Snow Wheelchair Pushing Forward Foundation, we're gonna do that. We're gonna continue his legacy and uh, so that his name and his legacy I go on for generations way past everybody that's here in this audience today. So, as Randy would say, thank you, good luck, keep pushing forward, and hook them horns. Thank you. Tom, at this time, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I'm happy to give you this certification of the induction of Randy Snow into the International Titus Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. We're honored to have with us today a dear friend of Mike Davis. Please welcome Ms. Ann Worcester, the tournament director of the New Haven Open. Ann? The man that I have the honor 
of introducing today is a mentor, a friend, and probably the most extraordinary innovator and businessman our sport has ever known. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes to paint a picture for you. The year is 1970. The open era in tennis is very recent and the sport is still relatively unknown. On a yellow legal pad, a man sketches out a bold idea, one that seemed unimaginable at the time. A global tennis tour of 20 tournaments with a year-end final and $1 million in total prize money. He broaches the idea with his boss at World Championship Tennis, Lamar Hunt, who buys in. Neither could know it then, but this first tour would shape the future of tennis. Fast forward to 1972, and two of the all-time great tennis players, Ken Rosewall and Rod Laver, reach the WCT final. Rosewall wins in a dramatic five-set tiebreak. But even more important than the victory was that the NBC televised match preempted the evening news. And in 1972, the evening t news got huge ratings, so that meant that the tennis final got huge ratings too, capturing the attention of TV viewers all over the country. So they realized they needed to deliver more of this, of this WCT tour to the masses. And the vehicle to do that was clearly through network television. So this bold, brave man walks back into NBC to pitch them on broadcasting eight WCT events plus the final. NBC agrees with, with one huge caveat. They tell him he has to raise $1 million in advertising dollars first, and then they would air the series. No one at N NBC thought he, or anyone at, for that matter, could do it. But the master salesman now needs to sell advertisers on his grand plan of a series of events in this nascent sport, an idea that hasn't ever been done before. He knows he, get, he needs to get creative, so he develops some gimmicks. A first ever refrigerator on court to keep the balls at optimum temperature, a first ever tip of the day for each broadcast, and more. Companies like Wilson, Volkswagen, and Polaroid, and others line up, and he has his $1 million in advertising. And big-time tennis is on its way in the United States. Over the next years, tennis explodes in this country. Participation rises from 11 million players to 33 million players. Indoor courts are being built everywhere, and racket, shoe, clothing, sales, and everything else tennis-related takes off. But he doesn't stop innovating. He introduced concepts that are mainstays in today's game. Players wearing colored clothing. The yellow tennis ball, which showed up better on television. Placing player chairs on the court during changeovers. And introducing rules like 30 seconds between points and 90 seconds between games. All of which made tennis more television friendly. Over his tennis career, this one man created a masterpiece one that forever changed how we view and interact with our sport. He never stopped innovating, and subsequently, his 50 years in this sport have created a work of art that will hang forever in the Tennis Hall of Fame. It is my privilege and my honor to introduce someone whose accomplishments and contributions will impact tennis for generations to come. He has left an indelible mark on the sport of tennis, and his legacy will live on forever. Now that is a true Hall of Famer. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you Mike Davis. Thank you, Ann. Um, I turned professional with Jack Kramer in 1960 at the age of 24 and was immediately banned from all the Grand Slams and Davis Cup. A few months later, Tony Trabert and I were scheduled to play a series of one-night matches in France and North Africa. At the first city in France, we were told to follow the hallway to where we could change. Well, we found the room to change in, but there was absolutely nothing in it, no hooks, no benches, no lockers. Now remember, it was only a few months earlier that Gus, the locker room attendant at Wimbledon, had been asking me whether I would be taking a shower or should he draw me a bath. 
So I turned to Tony and said, Trabe, where's the locker room? He looked around, went to his bag, dug into it, and produced a six-inch nail, which he proceeded to drive into the wall with his shoe. There's your locker room, rookie. Bring your own nail next time and get used to it. Anyone who has had the privilege of playing with or against Tony Trabert or has worked or even just known him has been touched by his professionalism and humanity. I certainly was, and I'm proud to be able to call him my friend and mentor. Thank you, Trabe. In 1968, the year of open tennis, I was 32 and was asked to join WCT, World Championship Tennis. I spent 13 years with Lamar Hunt and Al Hill Jr. learning the business side of the sport. Lamar taught me many things. One was that there are two words to show business, and most people forget the second word. WCT grew into a powerful force for pro tennis. We pioneered most of the changes that today are taken for granted. Yellow tennis balls, colored clothing, tiebreaker, umpire overrule, blue courts, chairs on the court, etc. We also took tennis to a lot of very exotic places. In 1971, for instance, when the Shah of Iran wanted a tennis tournament in Tehran, I sent our representative in London, John McDonald, out there to talk to him. He met with a very high official uh, a general in the army. He was in charge of the army. While the prize money of $50,000 was no problem, the organization was pretty sparse. John told the general that we needed ball boys and linesmen with good eyesight. The general replied, Ball boys are no problem, and I can let you have a dozen or so of my sniper division <laughs> to call the lines. The player said later that the line calls were exceptionally good. <laughs> After I left WCT in the early 80s, I served uh, a short stint as executive director of the ATP, and after that I was asked by Philippe Chatrier the then president of the ITF, to join him in their office in London as marketing director. I had come full circle from being a tennis rebel and an outcast pro in the early days and a business opponent when I ran WCT to now being an executive at the ITF, a period that had spanned almost 30 years. It was revealing that Philippe, whom I had even sued back in the days of WCT, would want to hire me as I am sure that I'd been a huge thorn in his side. So one night I asked Philippe why he'd hired me. He smiled and said, there was an old proverb that says that the best gamekeeper you can hire is an ex-poacher. So thank you, Philippe. Another person that I want to thank is Butch Buckles on my left. Butch and I played against each other as amateurs and professionals, worked at the ATP together, dreamed of tennis becoming a big time sport, and spent most of our life trying to see that it did. Butch has done so much for our sport, including creating the Lipton, now the Sony Ericsson in Miami, the first two-week men's and women's event in tennis outside of the Grand Slams. He has always been a visionary and will always be my friend. Thank you, Butch. I also owe a lot of gratitude to my late brother, Lee, who would have loved to be here today, and my parents, who gave me all they could. And a special thank you to Rod Laver, Donald L., and Ann Worcester. You know, there's an old saying that goes, if you need something done, give it to the busiest person you know. Ann Worcester is that person. Thank you to some dear friends who are here today to help me celebrate my fabulous staff at the New Haven Open at Yale. Marshall Happer and his wife, Karen. The Stokes, who came all the way from London. The Browns, 
and my current doubles partner, Joe Bachman, and his wife, Lola. Thank you for coming. And to my wife, Mina, thanks for picking me up when I fall down and break something, which, as my tennis friends in Florida will attest, is frequently. Also, to the members of the landings in Sarasota, my club, and to Kevin and Joe for naming the stadium court after me, which I hope to be playing on for many years to come. And thank you all at the Hall of Fame for keeping our sport alive through our history, which hopefully we all can learn from. I will close by accepting this award on behalf of all those professional players who were banned from playing Grand Slams for so many years, but were so instrumental in bringing about open tennis to our sport. Some like Pancho Gonzalez, Lou Hode, Kurt Nielsen, Robert Aye, and Barry McKay have passed on, but there are still some of us left to remember where we came from. Thank you. Mike, on behalf of the Board of Directors, it is my honor to present you, with the help of Stan, both your certificate certifying you as a member of the International Tennis Hall of Fame and your Hall of Fame blazer. Congratulations. <laughs> it was an honor when Manolo Orantes asked me to present him today. We all know that Spain has had some great players. The first great player was the 1984 Hall of Famer Manolo Santana. Following him about 10 years later was today's inductee. Manolo Orante, sometimes affectionately referred to as Manolito, little Manolo, following Manolo Santana. Like today's great left-handed Spanish player, Rafa, what's his name? Nadal. It was not much fun to play against him, particularly on clay. The lethal forehand, solid backhand, Tenacious all-court game created a nightmare for anybody before you played him. But actually, he was not only a great player, but also a wonderful sportsman on the court. So you could beat him, or he could beat you, but there would be a smile on his face and a genuinely great attitude on the court. He was a force to be reckoned from the late 1960s through the early 1980s. He reached number two in the world in August 23, 1973, and was ranked in the year-end world top 10 for four years, with two of those years being in the top five, 1975-1976. He captured 33 singles titles and 22 doubles titles. In the 1975 Open, he decisively beat the defending champion Jimmy Connors. This was an incredible win because the night before, he was in an epic battle with Guillermo Vilas, which lasted almost until midnight. This epic battle, where Manolo was down two sets to one, five games to none, 40-15 in the fourth set. Altogether, he forced off five match points, and it's considered to be one of the great U.S. Open era's matches, not to mention great comebacks. In Barcelona, Manola won three singles and two, three doubles titles. He was finalist in four singles and two doubles matches. In 1975, Manola won eight out of 13 finals. In 1976, seven out of 13 finals. He also won the WCT final in 1971. He has a long and distinguished Davis Cup career winning 39, losing 19 in singles, 21 and eight in doubles. He was a team captain of the Spanish team from 1975 
from 1987 to 1992, and he received the Davis Cup Award for Excellence in 1909, sorry, 2009. <laughs> wow, it's not that old. He also has the distinction of becoming the first unseated player to win the Orange Bowl Junior title when he was 18 years old. Manolo opened a tennis academy in Spain where some of the most promising young players have come to train, including Alex Carecha, Arancha Sanchez Victorio, Conchita Mart Martinez, Alberto Bertasegui, and Alberto Costa. I remember Manolo across the net as a great competitor, a wonderful sportsman, and a man who really loved the game. It's my honor to welcome Manolo Orantes into the 2012 Hall of Fame class. First of all, thank you very much to be here. I chose Stan Smith to be my doctor because I remember Wimbledon 72. I think you do, you do also because in the semifinal I lost to Anastasi. It was the first semifinal of the Grand Slam. And then I saw the final that he played against Elie. It was a, an unbelievable match. He won in five sets. And it's a match that I always remember all my life. Thank you, Stan. Well, thank you very much for your recognition. Tennis has given me many things in my life. First, I did enjoy a fantastic tennis career. Second, I'm having the privilege of being here today. First of all, I would like to thank my club, the Barcelona Club, because without their help, I would, I would never be able to have a professional career. I also would like to thank the people that have supported me during my whole career. My whole life has been about tennis, first as a player and after as an instructor. I always try to inculcate my passion and sportsman for the sport. Thanks to the tennis, I have the chance to meet a wonderful person, played with great players, and make good friends has also allowed me to fulfill many of my dreams. I dream, I dream it of being a tennis player, and I achieve it. I dream it of being one of the best, and I think I achieve it. I dream it to win a Grand Slam, and I won the US Open, which I remember has uh, Stan said, the, the second week, three matches that I play against Ilina Stase, the semifinal against Guillermo Villas, and the final with Jimmy Connors was the best three matches in my life. I also dream to be inducted to the Hall of Fame. And thanks to you, today I can say that this dream is true. Thank you very much. Finally, I want to thank my family, my, fa my wife Rosa, my son Paul, and Manel, and my nephews Monica and Carlota, and my friends Dean and Bobby that they're here with me today. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed this day. This is going to be one of my special days in my life. Thank you very much. Mamalito, Manolo, Arantes, it is my honor on behalf of the Board of Directors to present you your certificate of you. entry into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Congratulations. To honor our next inductee today, it is my pleasure to introduce once again one of the greatest players ever to play the game. A 2009 Hall of Famer, please welcome Ms. Monica Sellis. It's great to be back here at the Tennis Hall of Fame in beautiful Newport. 
to join my fellow Hall of Famers and the super fans who always come out year after year to support this tournament. It's also an important and happy day as we gather to celebrate the new class of inductees, including my friend Jennifer Capriotti. <laughs> Jennifer and I grew up together. We were two teenagers on the tour, thrown into this adult world where the spotlight was so bright, the expectations and the demands intense. While we competed fiercely against each other, we could also relate to one another. We shared a bond and great admiration and most importantly, mutual respect. It was impossible not to respect Jennifer. From the moment she arrived on tour, at the age of 13, she was a force. By the end of her first year, she had become the youngest player ever to finish ranked in the top 10, finishing the year ranked number 18 at age 14. <laughs> With her success and outgoing personality, she quickly became America's sweetheart. But this America sweetheart could crush the ball. Trust me, um, I been on the other end of them was no fun. But also, I got to experience it thankfully on the same side of the net when in Rome we won our, doubles, our only doubles title together. And looking back, Jennifer, I wish we played more. As accomplished as Jennifer was at such a young age, in 1992 she won at age 16, an Olympic gold medal for her country. It wasn't though during her early years that she achieved her greatest success. It was years later, after staring down challenges on court and off, when she showed us all what a true champion she is. In a comeback for the ages, through hard work and sheer determination, she would win all of her three Grand Slam titles and become number one in the world. Her force of will was on greatest display on a blistering day in Melbourne in 2002 when she found herself a set 0-4 down in the finals of the Australian Open facing another great champion, Martina Hingis. She would rally, fighting off four match points to win her final Grand Slam title. As powerful as her ground strokes were, it was her fight that was her greatest weapon. No matter what challenges were thrown Jennifer's way, she fought, she fought, and she fought. More than her incredible records, more than the power game that she helped pave the way for, her true legacy, that's her true legacy. It earned her more titles and more fans than anything else. Today, it earns her a place in the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Jennifer Capriotti. would happen. Uh, nobody told me the toughest part was holding back the tears. Um, first, I have to say um, welcome all and that this is such an, a, beautiful, a beautiful establishment, really. This couldn't be a more beautiful setting to hold this prestigious event. I'm so happy to be here. Monica, thank you from the bottom of my heart today for being here. That was a beautiful introduction. You are a friend, a great champion, and someone who inspired me as a great rival, an adversary on the court. I have always admired you for your relentless determination, your fight, and most importantly, your character as a person. You truly are a class act, and I'm honored to be introduced by you. Now a fellow Hall of Famer. It's only fitting that we are here together today. 
We both had a lot of similarities in our tennis life. Well, you won a lot more than I did, but. <laughs> <laughs> we both started so young. We were both tennis prodigies. We both faced many challenges on and off the court. We both became champions under extreme pressure and expectation. Not once, but twice. I don't think people will ever forget that 1991 US Open semifinal match. Which some say is one of the greatest matches ever. I know it's one of the greatest matches I've ever played. Will tennis ever see two teenagers again relentlessly hitting ground strokes so hard with such precision and mental toughness point after point? Trust me, being on the other side of the cannonballs coming off your racket was no fun either. <laughs> Not only did we become champions, but I feel we set the bar high and really were a part of transforming the game into what it is today. There is an unspoken bond I will always have with you. We fought against each other hard, but look at where we are now. It is a wonderful moment that our tennis lives have come full circle and we are able to come together again with such respect and support and are able to be on each other's side when it's all said and done. So thank you, you are a true champion. I also want to congratulate the other inductees here today. I'm honored to share the stage with you. You are all so deserving of this honor. Wow, everyone has had such an emotional journey to get here in story. Guga, <laughs> it's fitting that again we share another amazing moment in tennis. We both won the 2001 French Open, leaving our hearts on the court and you literally drawing it in the red clay. Those were my sentiments exactly. Hey, we never won a Wimbledon, but since this is on grass, does it sort of count? <laughs> <laughs> so I can't believe this day is here. I wasn't sure if it would ever come and if I would have the chance to take my place on center court again. It's been eight, eight years too long. Honestly, I never thought I would get this opportunity to be back at a place where I've spent all my life. A place where I literally grew up, transformed, and defined myself through. I've spent my life either being on a tennis court or missing the tennis court. It's humbling, it's gratifying, and it makes me so incredibly proud to be here today celebrating this moment with you all. When I received the call from the Hall of Fame that I was being nominated, the tears and emotions were just overwhelming. I left the game earlier than I expected, earlier than I wanted to, and because of this, I was not able to leave the game on my terms. I was not able to thank everyone who had such a positive impact on my life. I knew this honor would provide me with the platform to give thanks to those people. Those who helped me, loved me, believed in me, supported, in, supported me, and ultimately inspired me. I knew I would be able to pay tribute to a game I love and always think about. I also would be able to acknowledge and embrace what my blood, sweat, tears, determination, and heart has brought me. I would be able to remember who I am again and give me a voice again, my own voice, the true voice. It's really hard to describe all the amazing moments and experiences I've had in 36 years, what just seems like a few moments. I dreamed of tennis as a little girl. I dreamed of being the best. I have to say I achieved all of my dreams and more. 
Even though my life took some twists and turns that I didn't expect, I still managed to overcome adversity, win grand slams, pocket a gold medal, become the number one player in the world, and now stand at the podium, podium of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. This is one milestone I never thought I would achieve. I'm following the true legends of the game, the ones I idolized growing up, watched, and then had the privilege of playing against. Yes, I have come a long way from when I was a little girl, girl playing on the courts of Holiday Park, back when I was a pupil of Mr. Everett alongside my dad. I have a, I've come a long way since those days when I didn't know how to keep score. <laughs> and when I won, I didn't know I won until Mr. Everett had to tell me. <laughs> My feet didn't hit the ground on the changeovers, and they never did as the ride began from there. Tennis is all about timing, and how perfect and impeccable is this timing of this moment. From Monica being here, to Guga, to the Olympics coming up, remembering my 1992 gold medal win. That was the one of the greatest moments in my life. <laughs> to play for my country and win a gold medal, defeating another Hall of Famer and great champion, Stephanie Graf. The timing of this is very profound for me on such a personal level. Tennis have, has given me so much and challenged me in so many ways. It has given me great joy on and off the court, as well as a lot of pain on, on and off the court. But it has taught me what overcoming fear is all about. It has taught me what hard work and commitment means. It has taught me what self-love is. It has taught me what acceptance and forgiveness can bring. It hasn't always been easy, and I'm still learning. The transition and the acceptances I've had to make have been some of, most, some of the most difficult. And I've had to work hard on letting go. Letting go of the fact there might not be any more comebacks. But I don't need to be on a tennis court to be part of this game. I don't need to be on a tennis court to remember who I am. Tennis will forever be in my heart. This moment also comes at a crucial time. It is a moment that I needed to rejoice, embrace, accept, and truly love all that has encapsulated my life. I didn't walk away from the game of tennis because I wanted to. I stopped because I had to. I'd like to take this moment to express how, far to, how hard I fought to come back. It was a great struggle for me all these years dealing with the injuries and accepting the fact that I might not return to competition again. I worked extremely hard during my career on the court and equally as hard, if not harder, to come back. That is why this moment is so incredible for me on so many levels, because this is a return to the game I love. I thank my family, my friends, coaches, coaches trainers, opponents, for always supporting me and always believing in me. I thank those who are here and those who are not. To Mr. Everett, Rick Macy, Tommy Thompson, Jimmy Brown, Gully, Harold Solomon, Karen Burnett. There are so many of you to thank. You know who you are. I thank those of you who are here with me in spirit, my friend Darren, my grandparents, my grandma. I remember how much you loved watching me play and how it gave you so much joy the last few years of your life. Knowing that I was able to give you some entertainment made it so much more joyful for me. My family, it's been an amazing journey for us all. 
I know all of us did the best we could as a family. The love and support has always been there. Each one of my family members had their important roles. This is a moment I really want to thank my dad for teaching me all that I know and giving me the basic fundamentals for my tennis game. He knew how to teach me in a way that I best, best understood and trusted. He also taught me much about life off the court. He taught me what unconditional love is and what always being there really means. He has a heart of gold and I thank you, Dad, for being you. Same to my mother. Mom, you always knew how to keep it fun for me. My brother, Stephen, you have really come into your own and I am so proud. You are going great places. Thank you for the sacrifices and the support. I love you guys. My friends, to those who are here, Eva Maioli, another great champion. Who I shared so many fun moments with. <laughs> we shall not name them here. <laughs> and who I consider to be one of my best friends, as well as Molly and I. Thank you for, being, for both being here. And to those who are not here, you know who you are. I thank all my friends for always being there through the great times and the difficult. We all remember what an amazing time it was. Finally, I thank the Hall of Fame for giving me this honor. I thank the members of the voting press. And last but not least, I thank the fans. We love you. Love you too. You have always been in my corner throughout my career, and have always believed in me and who, in who I am. You, my fans, always knew I gave 100% each and every time I stepped on the court. I can only hope the next phase of my life will be as fulfilling as this last one. Throughout my career, tennis gave me the chance to express myself and show the determination I had, and also to do what mattered most to me, that is to inspire and touch the lives of others. I regret not, moment, not one moment of this life. It has all happened the way it's supposed to. This is not an end, but it is a reflection, reflection and capturing moment. It is a new beginning and a transition. A new beginning that is going to allow me to use that all, all that I accomplished on and off the court to inspire and help everyone to believe in themselves, love themselves, and be true to themselves. So thank you all so much. Jennifer, on behalf of the Board of Directors of the International Tennis Hall of Fame, it is my honor to present you your certification as a member into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Please. So let's just admit it. Moms are very special. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Guga's mother, Mrs. Alice Curtin. Good afternoon. When you speak with the heart, we need to cry. I apologize if my English is not good enough, but I will do my best to translate the feelings I have in my heart into words. 
I am a very happy mother of three wonderful sons, Rafael, Gustavo, and Guilherme, the later having already become a star in heaven with his father. By virtue of being Brazilian, we are a people that intensely experience union, alliance, group, and collective endeavors. And for this reason, sports like soccer and volleyball excel in our society. But there was a young man who decided to break these paradigms, turning an individual and more formal sport into a form of paving the way for success. The slim, tall, curly-haired boy, sometimes referred to as clay surfer, sometimes called Picasso of the courts, and as still other times know simply, simply as a boy, is Gustavo Kirchen, most often known as Guga. <laughs> Guga is now a man who succeeded in life by challenging his own limits and also his social economic possibilities. He succe succeeded because he believed in himself and because he laughed and loved intensely. Guga lived every moment of his life with passion, especially in regards to his sporting life. He fought in every match until the last minute. He always believed he could win. He cried when he lost and smiled when he won. Guga won the respect and admiration of people through his conduct in tennis and in life. And he captured the love of children who turned him into a model to be followed. Through his achieve achievements, Guga brought the sport of tennis into the sport light in Brazil. Tennis found new followers from all regions and all walks of life, walks, walks of life, sorry. Some of these followers played with rackets, but others with wood sticks, but all tried to imitate the one who gave them so much happiness. Because of Google, reporters started to narrate a tennis match with the same, tennis match with the same emotion as they narrate a soccer game with details that allow blind people to say, I could see and understand Guga's game. Therefore, I today introduce, ladies and gentlemen, this boy who at present is a father and who shows every day to our country, Brazil, and we might even say to the whole world that dreaming is allowed and believing in dreams while fighting for them with discipline, dedication, humbleness, and perseverance is a way to make them come true. And even though his dreams were inter interrupted due to some injuries, Guga still provides socially and economically vulnerable children and teenagers with opportunities related to sports arts and culture that allow them to glimpse a world with more dignity and wide right to citizenship. Guga continues to devote himself to the development of, of tennis, creating new projects and supporting others. I didn't mention his titles and material achievements because they are known and visible to everybody. I chose to talk about things that cannot be seen, but that can be felt by the heart and by gratitude. Guga is a boy and will always be a boy, Sue, <laughs> who searches for the best in others and who has given the best of himself. Thanks for receiving our Guga from Brazil 
in this so desired spot, the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. I thought it would take me longer to cry. <laughs> Just to the beginning, before the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what's harder for me if it's to get uh, this far on the Hall of Fame or do the speech. <laughs> but as my mother told, I never give up, so I'll go ahead. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, first of all, it's an honor to watch my mother talk uh, about me a little bit. And uh, I always get embarrassed <laughs> when she talks good things about me. Not today, <laughs> at least. I was very honored. So, first, uh, I would like to congratulate the my fellow Hall of Famers. Uh, I believe he. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Everyone has uh, it, its singles uh, achievement or uh, single particular things who, who that. Uh, do it for, for tennis, and uh, that's the same way I look at the sports, not only here, limited to the, to the court. So, uh, especially big honor for Mr. Snow, for me to be part of your uh, party and friends as I had a a handicap, a handicap brother as well. I could live this fortunate experience. It's a great honor for me to be together with your son and my brother as well, getting this, this award. <laughs> Jennifer, I don't want to compare my career with you. Otherwise, they will think twice if they will uh, <laughs> accept me to, to the Hall of Fame. I was a teenager, first traveling to the United States, 13, and you, the same way, age, being the same final in the French Open and the Wimbledon, uh, being top 10 in the world, so <laughs> it's better stop right here. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and Manuel, I believe different than you, still, for me, it's really, uh, I'm still trying to, to understand or to figure out how I did end up being in this privileged place. Uh, I could even dream to become a champion, like I said. Things was too far away, was too, the distance was miles and miles away that uh, perhaps the one who, who could, uh, uh, dream at the beginning was my father, the the person that uh, I believe uh, it got me to to love this game. He's still the one I first remember when Chris went back to Brazil and got me to know that I was be part of this amazing experience. He's my hero, my father, my idol, so he's the one that I dedicate the, the most this, this title as uh, I can call, I believe. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I didn't, as you see, I didn't write anything as my English, you can tell, is not that good. Imagine if I have to write it. 
<laughs> then, then we'd be a, a hard time. It would take forever. But what I, I, I was trying to, to tell in this brief moment, few minutes, is how it, it really could happen. Uh, I believe I had uh, to find a way to relate with tennis and the right people inside of me and uh, surround me. On this way, uh, I start to understand and tennis show me and introduce me to people and show me experience that uh, I believe uh, my life is not all about tennis, but uh, tennis is in every single thing of, of my life, that's for sure. So I, I got to, to live my best experience on tennis. As the first I can remember, my father gave me the racket for the first time. And also, tennis took him away from me as he passed away in the tennis court and playing a game. Uh, I was three times a uh, Grand Slam champion. It's a great... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great uh, honor, but I had uh, the experience in our life as my mother, it happened for us to almost sell the house. We sell the car, we sell the piano, we sell everything <laughs> for me to be able to, to travel around. And uh, we didn't know where we were going. <laughs> we know we, we were in the right track, in the right way, but we didn't know where we were going. We just was confident that uh, we would find uh, a nice uh, finish and end up. At the same time, tennis took away my father. It uh, gave me two, two fathers instead. Larry, my coach, is here, and my older brother, Rafael. <laughs> it seems like a, it, it like it's how life it is. It, it starts to, to play with you as the game. It starts to, to challenge you sometime. And this was uh, perhaps the most fortunate thing it, it happened to me, even knowing that I had to drop off having a father to get to know this guy, Larry, who made me believe that I could uh, go farther, who before I even imagined that existed uh, a Hall of Fame, that uh, a tennis could, I could live professional tennis, he knew already I could be a number one in the world. So this, this is how I so much appreciated what I have and uh, what uh, what tennis brought to me, so many nice people, important people, great memories. It's easy to, it's easy to, uh, to difference. The happiest one and the tough ones or the dramatics, the, the sad ones, as you see. But every single one in the, even the hardest I had, it's very valuable. I think it's this what uh, made myself today who I am. I believe instead of me here, these people, this person should be the ones to receive uh, this honor with me. I'm forgetting a little bit of my grandmother if I for, don't talk about her, I know I will have, a, I will she will give me trouble when I'm back home. <laughs> she were, were known as my 
coach advice for some while. I'm sure I extend her life for a dozens of uh, years as she's still there. On, uh, it happened to us in 2000, she said, Larry lives uh, 70 kilometers in the same city of her from me. And I ask all the, all the weekends, please, grandmother, come to our house. We have a, a barbecue. We can do a lunch. No, it's too far away. But then French Open semifinal, Paris, very close. <laughs> <laughs> she was ready. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> So that's, uh, I think I was successful enough to, to translate a little bit what my life is and how I, I got here, very sp spontaneous thing with all these people connect to me and learning from tennis that uh, it depends a lot uh, how we, we look at things. Uh, perhaps tennis teach me to, to look at the greatest picture or even the hard experience with a, a colorful lights or in a, in a colorful way. So like this, I just uh, want to thank so much to, to let me in for this place that was a few years ago, it's still annoying by myself. It's an honor to, to see the flag of my country, to sing the, the Hainu, Brazilian Hainu here, and still being able to achieve, uh, achieve uh, uh, things for, for me as my fellow countries. So this day will be, will be uh, intense in my mind as, as I hope my contribution with tennis, it doesn't stop right here. I hope I can do more. As my mother example, it's easy to say. I hope I can go farther. The only thing that tennis didn't give to me, and perhaps one of the most important things my, in my life, is to meet my wife, a special... <laughs> A special, very, very special person, a great At mother. At Newport, Rhode Island, the induction ceremony Always for the International Tele Tennis Hall of Fame just concluding. Gustavo Kirtan making the final speech ago. of the day. He, she, she never watched one single match of me. <laughs> I have to complain about this. She could not be perfect. <laughs> but she is. <laughs> She's perfect. We live, I live this great moment, being able to, to celebrate. I know uh, because of that I could use, could use tennis to tell her histories to get in love with me, that's for sure. <laughs> I even told her that I won tw uh, three times as well Australia, Wimbledon, and US Open, she believed it. <laughs> <laughs> Then she accepted to marry me. <laughs> I know it wasn't for that. <laughs> but it's lovely to see all of you here, even her family, uh, Larry's family, Carla, people who work with me right now, Luciano, Jorge, who were with me from the beginning, who got me the First contract in the Orange Bowl, Jorge. Otherwise, we had to stop. <laughs> was hard times. Andre here too in the ATP. So everybody, Clarissa, it's uh, the Brazilians, as I can see, the flags and the shirts around. I think as, especially comparing with the ones here who received the award, I did uh, a little but it's increased. So I will get going, and uh, in the future, I, I hope to be back here as I felt 
at home, especially with this warm weather. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gustavo Guga Curtin. It is my honor on behalf of the Board of Directors to give you this cer certificate as a member of the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Yeah. Cheers. There's so So Gustavo Kirtan receiving his certificate and a clay, a, a, a heart, uh, put in the grass on center court here in Newport, just as he did when he etched it in the red clay after winning at Roland Garros two decades ago. And so Gustavo Kirtan's coming full circle. We are happy to have with us Ambassador Luis Felipe de Seixas Correa, Consul General of, the, of, of Brazil in New York, as well as Ambassador Julio P. Fiel, General Counsel of Chile in New York, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> Mrs. Curtin, bravo. You did an excellent job. Thank you. So, Tom, Mike, Manolo, Guga, Jennifer have now received the highest honor and recognition in the sport of tennis. In acknowledgement of their accomplishments, both on and off the court, I'd ask them to take, our, to take the walk, our traditional victory lap around the court. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2012 induction class of the International Tennis Hall of Fame and Museum.